Angels are saying grow strong in your weakness. Some of my children I've gifted with abundant strength and stamina. Others, like you, have received the humble gift of frailty. Your fragility is not a punishment, nor does it indicate lack of faith. On the contrary, weak ones like you must live by faith, depending on me to get you through the day. I am developing your ability to trust me, to lean on me, rather than on your understanding. Your natural preference is to plan out your day, knowing what will happen when. My pref is for you to depend on me continually, trusting me to guide you and strengthen you as needed. This is how you grow strong in your weakness. What are you doing on Good Friday? Jesus schedule. My schedule 12 a.m. Jesus is arrested. 2 a.m. Jesus is sent to Annas, then Cephas 4 a.m. Jesus is with the soldiers and in prison. 6 a.m. Jesus is before Cephas a second time. 7 a.m. Jesus is before Pilate and sent to Herod. 8 hours a.m. Jesus returns to Pilate and is scourged. 9 hours a.m. Jesus is crowned with thorns and condemned to death. 10 hours a.m. Jesus is stripped of his garments and carries his cross. 12 hour 3 hours p.m. Jesus is on the cross. 3 hours p.m. Jesus dies on the cross. The soldiers pierced his side with a spear. 4 hours p.m. Jesus is taken down from the cross and laid in the tomb. Good Friday. The day that Satan thinks he won, but little did he know, God was just counting to three. The day that Jesus proved his love for us was great, the greatest ever to be, that he would lay down his life for us. This is that day. This was the day that God turned his back on his own son, because it was too much to bear what had happened to him. This was the day even the heavens darkened. Yet it's considered Good Friday. Why? Because despite the pain and anguish Jesus went through, it was the day that it was finished. His life's purpose, the one thing he came for, had been done. Those simple words, it is finished, were the words of salvation and mercy as his blood ran down that wood. It was the day that God and man would not be separated anymore. It was the day that Jesus saved the world, and we didn't even know it yet. And three days later, he rose again, defeated the grave, defeated death, so that one day we will too. He did that for you and I, and that is why it is called Good Friday, because the goodness of God was shown more clearly than ever that day on that cross as his blood ran down for God is the number one provider and is aware of your physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. It is his delight to provide you with love and guidance. When we are going through a time of need, we should call on God. Bring him your burdens. He knows your situation. We can't make it without him. Call on him to comfort your heart and give you strength. By seeking him first, we are able to discern God's direction, and He will be glorified as He provides for us and directs us according to His will. If you are ready to honor these truths as you seek His glory, begin with this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, help me to be grateful for what I have, to remember that I don't need most of what I want, and that joy is found in simplicity and generosity. Amen. I used to believe I just had to have enough faith and God would do what I asked. If he didn't, I was sinning too much or my faith was too small. These were lies. God doesn't do things because we sin less or have bigger faith, but only because he loves us. If this wasn't true, then the cross wasn't so great. If I could somehow have a larger faith, which nobody can, then the faith of Christ for me at the cross wasn't enough. 
So what does my faith do? A better question is, what has it done? It allowed me to enter into God's rest through Jesus once. The legalist wants you to prove your faith. God wants you to rest in it. We've all been given faith. That's not the question. The question is, will we use it to rest in Jesus? Our faith doesn't activate God or cause him to do something. He was already active before he created us, and he did something by sending Jesus here. Our faith simply allows us to enter into and enjoy what God has already done. The man or woman that leaves the place that God has given him or her in order to please. Inclination and acts on his own devised plan meets with disappointment because he has chosen his way instead of God's way. Human beings suffer much because they step out of the path that God has chosen for them to follow. They walk in the sparks of the fire they themselves have kindled, and the sure result is affliction, unrest, and sorrow, which they might have avoided if they had submitted their will to God. Whatever path God chooses for us, whatever way He ordains for our feet, that is the only path of safety. With the eye of faith, with childlike submission as obedient children, we must look to God to follow His guidance and difficulties will clear away. The promise is, I will instruct thee and teach thee. Sons and daughters of God, Father God in the name of Jesus, we come before you today praying that you would help us to forgive people who have made false accusations against us. Lord, so many times in life people have lied to us or accused us of something we didn't do. Lord, if we find ourselves in a season of being wrongfully accused or misunderstood, please help us to be responsible enough to try and clear the air, but after that we know the battle is yours and not ours. Lord, we know that. You know the truth, and you have the power to make the truth known. Lord, expose the false accusers in the situation. Lord, help us understand. There is no amount of convincing or arguing we can do to make someone believe us, and all we need to do is pray about the situation and let you handle it. Lord, we know it's not. Your will for someone to falsely accuse another but we know you can take any situation and use it for your glory and our belief. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. Life isn't always easy, and the things that are going on around us remind us how much we need God's abiding presence. When we struggle to understand what's going on in our personal lives or the world around us, we can seek His face by prayer and reading his word. God brings us the peace and courage we so desperately need in our lives. If you are facing a painful experience, look around you and find reasons to praise God for his goodness, even in the pain. You can reflect on God's goodness with this powerful prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being good and for blessing my life with good. Even when bad things happen, I know that you are good and you do good. I cling to you and pray that you will continue to perform in me that which is good for your glory. Amen. When a woman has a kingdom heart, she has an active understanding of what matters most to the heart of God. She lives in the balance of passion and contentment. She learns to love well give without regard to self, and forgive without hesitation. The woman with a kingdom heart may have a duffel bag full of possessions or enough treasures to fill a mansion, but she has learned to hold them with an open hand. Hold everything with open hands. I don't think we are ever allowed to grab hold of anything or anyone as though they matter more than the kingdom of heaven. When you hold relationships with open hands, then people come in and out of your life as gifts of grace to be cherished and enjoyed, not objects to be owned and manipulated. 
And then when you hold your dreams with open hands, you get to watch God resurrect what seemed dead and multiply what seemed small. Lord Christ, you are my king, and I have no other. I will follow the laws of men where I can do so without offending your holy ordinances and teachings, for your Bible has taught us to obey the civil authorities. I will pay my taxes, and I will render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but they do not have my heart, and they do not have my soul. For my king does not sit in a palace of stone. My king does not wear robes trimmed with fur. My king does not make promises he cannot keep. My king cannot be corrupted, will never shame, I will never make excuses. My king will never cover up his wrongdoing, because my king commits no wrong, hates no man, and would give up his very life for me. For my king is Jesus Christ, the almighty God of heaven and earth, clothed in righteousness, crowned by truth and seated on a throne of eternal glory. And to you and you alone I swear my allegiance, my faith, my hope, my life and my soul, today and as long as I live. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, the great, mighty, and awesome God, exalted God, who bestows bountiful kindness, who creates all things, who remembers the piety of the saints, and who, in love, has brought a Redeemer to us, our forefathers and our children, for the sake of His name. O mighty King, you are a helper, a savior, and a shield. You resurrect the dead. You are powerful to save us in forgiveness of our sins. You cause the dew to descend. You cause the wind to blow and the rain to fall. You sustain the living with loving kindness, support the falling, heal the sick, release the slave. You fulfill your trust to those who sleep in the dust. Who is like you, mighty Father? And who can be compared to you, King of Peace, who defeats death and restores life and causes deliverance to spring forth? Who is your equal, Great Comforter, who brings holiness to all who call upon you? You are holy, and your name is holy. The angels and all the creatures of heaven and earth praise you daily for all eternity. Lord, may nothing separate me from you today. Teach me how to choose only your way today, so each step will lead me closer to you. Help me walk by the word and not my feelings. Help me to keep my heart pure and undivided. Protect me from my own careless thoughts, words, and actions. And keep me from being distracted by my wants my desires, my thoughts on how things should be. Help me to embrace what comes my way as an opportunity, rather than a personal inconvenience. And finally, help me to rest in the truth of Psalm 86, 13, Great is your love toward me. You already see the ways I will fall short and mess up, but right now, I consciously tuck your whisper of absolute love for me into the deepest part of my heart. I recognize your love for me is not based on my performance. You love me warts and all. That's amazing. But what's most amazing is that the Savior of the world would desire a few minutes with me this morning. Lord, help me to forever remember what a gift it is to be with you like this. Amen. I can't imagine this day and what it had to have been like for the disciples. They knew what Jesus had said, but they also knew that Jesus was nailed to a cross. I have to imagine that they wondered if he would keep his word. Would he really rise again tomorrow? Can he do it? This day must have been full of darkness and questioning and waiting, but just as he promised, he fulfilled. I feel like this is where we all, every nation and tongue, are at again. 
We know what he's done in the past and what he's promised to do, but we're waiting. So I think it's important to know and remember that day three is coming again, y'all. He rose out of the grave to save us all then, and now he's coming back. We may not know how long we have to wait, but y'all, he's coming. Fast. It's easy to be discouraged by everything around us in the world and in our lives. But breath by breath, through every exhale, we are closer to his embrace. So on this dark Saturday, hold on to the promises he's made. Pretty soon the light will break through and all of creation will know that Jesus is Lord. Sometimes he has to bring you back to the place you first found him, on your knees, broken and recognizing that you cannot do it whatever it may be without him. He did not bring you this far to fix you. He brought you through the storm and held you as you went through deep waters so that his truths could become fully known by you. He pulled you back to the place where you thought you'd never be enough to show you that you don't have to be. He was enough yesterday. He is enough today. He will be enough forevermore. It is in your weakness that his power is made perfect. At the food of the mountain you thought was too great to climb, he will be your strength. He put you here so you can truly see the ever-so-faithful, miracle-working, God Almighty he is. God's love isn't only to comfort you in your brokenness or to shelter you from the fire. God's love uproots every seed of fear, insecurity, and doubt that was planted by the enemy. He sprinkles your soil clean with holy water, places within you seeds of his strength and courage, and brings you to the place where you may grow into the garden you were created to be in his glorious light. Come to me and rest. Give your mind a break from its habitual judging. You form judgments about this situation, that situation, this person, that person, yourself, even the weather as if judging were your main function in life. But I created you first and foremost to know me and to live in rich communication with me. When you become preoccupied with passing judgment, you usurp my role, relate to me as creature to creator, sheep to shepherd, subject to king, clay to potter. Allow me to have my way in your life. Rather than evaluating my ways with you, accept them thankfully. The inti macy I offer you is not an invitation to act as if you were my equal. Worship me as king of kings while walking hand in hand with me down the path of life. Open your mind and heart, your entire being to receive my love in full measure. So many of my children limp through their lives starving for love because they haven't learned the art of receiving. This is essentially an act of faith, believing that I love you with boundless, everlasting love. The art of receiving is also a discipline, training your mind to trust me, coming close to me with confidence. Remember that the evil one is the father of lies. Learn to recognize his deceptive intrusions into your thoughts. One of his favorite deceptions is to undermine your confidence in my unconditional love. Fight back against these lies. Do not let them go unchallenged. Resist the devil in my name, and he will slink away from you. Draw near to me, and my presence will envelop you in love. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways and thoughts higher than yours. Remember who I am when you spend time with me. Marvel at the wonder of being able to commune with the king of the universe any time, any place. Never take this amazing privilege for granted. Though I am vastly higher and greater than you, I am training you to think my thoughts. As you spend time in my presence, my thoughts gradually form in your mind. 
My spirit is the director of this process. Sometimes he brings Bible verses to mind. Sometimes he enables you to hear me speak directly to you. These communications strengthen you and prepare you for whatever is before you on your life path. Take time to listen to my voice. Through your sacrifice of precious time, I bless you far more than you dare to ask. Meet me in early morning splendor. I eagerly await you here. In the stillness of this holy time with me, I renew your strength and saturate you with peace. While others turn over for extra sleep or anxiously tune in to the latest news, you commune with the creator of the universe. I have awakened in your heart a strong desire to know me. This longing in me, though it now burns brightly in you, when you seek my face in response to my love call, both of us are blessed. This is a deep mystery, designed more for your enjoyment than for your understanding. I am not a door God who discourages pleasure. I delight in your enjoyment of everything that is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think on these things and my light in you will shine brighter day by day. Make friends with the problems in your life. Though many things feel random and wrong, remember that I am sovereign over everything. I can fit everything into a pattern for good, but only to the extent that you trust me. Every problem can teach you something, transforming you little by little into the masterpiece I created you to be. The very same problem can become a stumbling block over which you fall if you react with distrust and defiance. The choice is up to you, and you will have to choose many times each day whether to trust me or defy me. The best way to befriend your problems is to thank me for them. This simple act opens your mind to the possibility of benefits flowing from your difficult ties. You can even give persistent problems nicknames, helping you to approach them with familiarity rather than with dread. The next step is to introduce them to me, enabling me to embrace them in my loving presence. I will not necessarily remove your problems, but my wisdom is sufficient to bring good out of every one of them. I was watching the sunrise this morning and had a realization. Every time I try to take a photo of it, it never truly expresses the beauty of this God-given gift that arrives every morning. I can try and show people the sunrise, but no matter what camera I have or what lens I use, it never comes out right. So why not just experience it ourselves? I love beach sunrises because it's just the open horizon and you can perfectly see the beautiful masterpiece from God right in front of you. Then I got to thinking, this is just like our relationship with God. No matter how hard we try to focus on other people's relationships with God and compare them to our own, it doesn't grow our own relationship with Him. Our relationship with God is something we need to experience ourselves. No matter how many sermons or church retreats you go to, it won't bring you closer to God. You have to seek God and love Him, just like He is doing to you. Just like the sunrise, we can always count on it being there every morning. Though clouds and buildings may obstruct our view, we still know it's there. We feel its presence. Bible Story, Good Friday, God's Unfolding Story Element, God Sent Jesus to Help Us This summary includes the trials of Jesus that took place after the Lord's Supper, Passover meal. Jesus shared with his disciples and immediately prior to his crucifixion. You may wish to summarize the trials in order to focus on just the crucifixion. In either case, there's a lot of detail to the story that we have not included here. Use your discretion in determining how much to explain to the kids you're teaching. We have also included some comments regarding the reason Jesus had to die that you may find helpful. 
Our story takes place just after Jesus had been arrested and taken to the high priest, Caiaphas. All night, the religious leaders had questioned Jesus to try and find a reason to kill him. When Jesus was asked if he was the Messiah, Jesus replied, You are right. To the religious leaders, this was enough evidence for them. They did not want to believe that Jesus was God's Son, the Messiah. The high priest accused Jesus of breaking the law, and his punishment was death. The next morning, God, it's easy for me to worry about circumstances in my life. Each day, help me to remember that you are always in control. Today, I'm trusting in your provision, protection, and plans for me. Because I know you care about every need and desire I have, I know I can rest. Give me peace as I give you control of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus was taken to the governor of the territory. His name was Pilate. The religious leaders wanted Pilate to sentence Jesus to death. At first, Pilate said he could not find any fault in Jesus. But Pilate was afraid of the people, so he handed Jesus over to the religious leaders. They shouted, Take him away! Crucify him! So they took Jesus away, carrying his own cross. They took him to a place called Golgotha. There they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Boys and girls, why do you think Jesus had to die? Pause for responses. Until Jesus came, God required the people to sacrifice animals for their sins. The animals took the punishment for each person's sins. These sacrifices had to be made every day because people sinned every day. The Bible says we are all sinners, and just like you have consequences for disobeying your parents, even more we have a consequence for our sins against God. The consequence of our sin is death and separation from God. But God loves us and does not want to be separated from us. Jesus came to take our consequence for us. He chose to die in our place. Like the animals took the place for the sins of the people, Jesus took our place. Now we can live with God and not be separated from Him. After hanging on the cross for several hours, Jesus said, It is finished. That meant that the debt had been paid for everyone. No longer would there be a need for animals to be sacrificed. Jesus took all of the punishment for our sins. The cross was Jesus' punishment for your sins and mine. It was a cruel and terrible way to die. Jesus did not deserve to die. He was perfect. But Jesus loved us so much that he was willing to die for you and me, to change the defects in your life. You've got to have people in your life to tell you the truth. You're not going to get well on your own. You're going to need support. You're going to need a small group. Change requires honest community. The things in your life you're never going to be able to change on your own are typically the things that are the most difficult in your life. They're also often the things you don't want anybody else to know about. You're never going to get over those things until you share them with someone. You don't have to tell everybody. You just need to find at least one person who will trust you and whom you trust, someone who will be confidential, love you unconditionally, not be judgmental, and pray for you. You'll find that revealing your feelings is the beginning of healing. This does not mean a small group where you get together on a superficial level and everyone is fine or doing great. You have to get to the level of maturity in your small group where you can say, I had a tough week. Life is really hard right now. Here's what happened. Ephesians 4.25 says, So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. If you're a believer, you're also a believer. 
You belong in God's family, and every other believer belongs to you. You cannot become until you belong. You can't become what God wants you to be until you belong in a group that's going to have a gut-level, honest community. So put away falsehood. Tell your friend the truth, because we belong to each. Ecclesiastes 4.10 says, If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. If you are serious about changing the deepest hang-ups and defects in your life, you're going to have to face the fear of being honest. You've got to stop faking it. You've got to be real. You can go through life one of two ways, pretending like you've got it all together or getting it all together. But you'll never get it all together as long as you pretend you've got it all together. In God's family, we belong to each other. Let's be honest with each other so we can help each other make the changes that bring health and healing. Give your worries to God. What is daily bread? It is the necessities of life, our physical and material needs that we're always worrying about. God wants you to ask Him to provide those things so you don't have to worry about them. What do you need today? Energy, to make it through the day. Finances? Wisdom? You've got two alternatives, panic or pray. Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. God says you can pray about everything. Nothing is too great for God's power. Nothing is too insignificant for His care. Anything worth worrying about is worth praying about. If we prayed as much as we worried, we'd have a lot less to worry about. Give God your worries. Then you need to be specific. When you pray generically, God bless me, how are you going to know if he answered it or not? Notice the Philippian verse also says, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. When you pray, be specific and do it with thanksgiving. Gratitude is the healthiest emotion you can have, psychologists say. The more you develop an attitude of appreciation for God, your family, and other people, the healthier you are emotionally approach problems with a light touch. When your mind moves toward a problem area, you tend to focus on that situation so intensely that you lose sight of me. You pit yourself against the difficulty as if you had to conquer it immediately. Your mind gears up for battle and your body becomes tense and anxious. Unless you achieve total victory, you feel defeated. There is a better way. When a problem starts to overshadow your thoughts, bring this matter to me, talk with me about it, and look at it in the light of my presence. This puts some much-needed space between you and your concern, enabling you to see from my perspective. You will be surprised at the results. Sometimes you may even laugh at yourself for being so serious about something so insignificant. You will always face trouble in this life. But more importantly, you will always have me with you, helping you to handle whatever you encounter. Approach problems with a light touch by viewing them in my revealing light. God didn't put you and him together for a reason, and only God knows what's really best for you. And right now it could hurt a lot, or a lil that er, not with him BC you actually liked him. And y'all had moments but later on, er gonna see why God didn't put y'all together, and you'll be happier about the situation. God did it BC later on. It's going to be a blessing and not a heartbreak. Just trust his plan and his perfect timing. Asking God, prayer, isn't going to get a field planted. You have to go out there and plant the seeds. If you don't, you will look at your surroundings and everyone's field will be producing but yours. In that case, you cannot be upset if the people around you sowed and did the work and they are seeing a harvest but your field is empty. If you are not willing to sow, 
then you will not reap. We can stand in our seedless field and worry why it's not growing. In fact, we worry instead of spending our time planting seeds in the field. If you don't want to work, then don't speak, don't ask, and don't knock. Everything you believe in God is going to come with some work. And if you don't want to work really hard to produce a big harvest, then you should not ask for a big purpose. You will receive a big harvest when you are willing to work hard. The people you see being blessed are receiving an overflow blessing because they sow an overflow of seeds. Do not be jealous of others who are reaping more. Rather, question what you have sown. I asked God why he made me too sensitive, and he promised me that it wasn't a mistake. He purposely made me delicate, not so that I could shatter easily, not so that I could be frail, not so that I could be told I'm too soft whenever someone tries to touch me. It was so I could know of the gentle beauty in living. And in my tenderness, I can love in a way the world may not know of yet. My compassion has the power to speak raging waves to calmness, and I can appreciate the little things he created that go unnoticed. There is something special in being fragile, and it has nothing to do with weakness and everything to do with strength. Being sensitive is a gift, he answered, and I shouldn't be ashamed of it. If God wants you to have it, the blessing will forever have your name on it. There is nothing that you can or cannot do to change that as you continue walking the way God wants you to walk. And that is why it is important to not overthink or harbor over the way things unfold in your life. There is a certain timing and purpose attached to everything that you face in life. As you begin to truly rely on faith and not sight, you will realize that your circumstances are actually working for you, not against. I know that I serve a God who is bigger than anything that I am facing today. No matter what happens or what the outcome will be, I know that He is in control and He has a plan for my life, a plan that will prosper me and not harm me, one that will give me a bright future. I don't know if that means that I am going to be healed, have my relationships restored, experience financial breakthroughs, be married, or have children. However, I find so much peace in knowing that He is taking care of me and will always provide. I will never lack or be without as long as I continue walking with Him. You don't really know if you're walking by faith and not by sight until you literally cannot see, plan, or prepare for the next step. Stepping out and taking a risk sounds awesome until it comes to the moment you actually have to step out and take the risk. Don't be surprised if you are hit by a wave of doubt, fear, insecurity, or even start second-guessing yourself. It's normal. The enemy wants you to stay stuck, draw back, or change your mind. This is the moment you need to be strong and very courageous. You must trust what you do know about God more than what you don't know about the future. If you don't step out, you'll never find out if it really is God or not. You have been called to more than a life of comfort, ease, safety, and security. We are invited into the faith adventure with Jesus. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. With faith, all things are possible in Him. Remember, the righteous will live by faith. When you have no idea how you'll get through this season, remind yourself that God will make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. He wants to do something new in your life. Fear and worry tend to sneak up behind you, filling your mind with doubt, distress, and confusion, but fight it off with what God has promised through His Word. In the wilderness, remember that God has already made a way. None of what you are going through in this season of your life today is a surprise to God. You don't have to wander trying to find the path. Listen to His voice and follow His leadership. 
He will give you a clear path with signs to follow. And when you don't know where to go, remain in faith until He shows you God has allowed in the lives of each of us some sort of loss, the withdrawal of something we valued in order that we may learn to offer ourselves a little more willingly, to allow the touch of death on one more thing we have clutched so tightly and thus know fullness and freedom and joy that much sooner. We're not naturally inclined to love God and seek His kingdom. Trouble may help to incline us, that is. It may tip us over. Subscribe our YouTube channel to reach 30,000 divine subscribers before April begins. Please help me by sharing super thanks. Share this to our family and friends. Thanks for watching.